Fire is a natural part of the uh, Australian environment, particularly the bush environment. We will experience it again and you have to expect if you live in a rural environment that you will be impacted by fires. It's not a maybe, it's a will be. Perhaps not to the extent of the uh, Black Saturday fires. God forbid that's a, a one in a hundred year event, so I'm told. But it can and it will happen again. And we will certainly experience wildfires. It shouldn't put people off. You simply need to make plans and be aware that it will happen and make those plans viable for your survival. We believe that the mental preparedness is just as important as the physical preparedness for fires. And by mental preparedness, I mean having some expectation of, of fire behaviour, what the fire is going to look like, um, what will happen with embers and wind and the heat, the radiant heat, and the size of the flames, uh, how long it will take uh, for the fire front to go through, all those sorts of things. And it's important to have a mental picture of what is likely to happen. If you decide to stay and defend your house, you need to be extremely strong mentally because you can't, when that fire approaches you, you, you have to be able to stand there and, and mentally um, be able to cope with it. But you can't panic. If you panic, you are basically lost. You need to have the strongest, the strongest will, is all I can say, to say, yes, I can do it, and, and stand there and face it. Because if you don't have that mental capacity to do it, you just don't stay and defend. You need to leave. Our long-term planning, ever since we've lived here over the 24 years, has involved um, looking at what we call both dry defence and wet defence uh, preparation. So dry defence is, is things like vegetation management, so making sure the grass is reduced and before summer raking loose mulch off gardens and reducing the flammable material close to the house. What we call wet defence is, is defence relying on water. We wanted to rely on a secure water supply and gravity feed water supply to us was the, the most reliable. Our fire plan is to be self-sufficient and not actually expect any fire trucks to turn up. We consider that to be a bonus if that happens, but uh, we worked on the basis that uh, fire crews would be elsewhere and not in front of a major fire like that. They'd be elsewhere protecting other communities and so on, um, and not at our place. Because um, of our knowledge of what embers can do and where they can go and how fine they are, and considering that they're wind driven, what I did was uh, lift the ridge capping on the roof and place rock wool insulation. What that does is block up the, any gaps under the, the ridge capping where embers can blow into the roof space and cause fires in the roof space. Once you get a fire starting in the roof space, it is very difficult to manage and to put out. That was a prime focus around the house, is to block up the roof space. During summer, what we do is put up shade cloth around the verandas to uh, keep the heat out of the windows. It's a wall of shade cloth that we have around the outside of the verandas and we found that to be very effective during the Black Saturday fires. The shade cloth did was to not only protect the windows from direct radiant heat, but wind blowing embers would hit the shade cloth and those embers would fall into the moist garden below and not land on the veranda and start spot fires. Like many people in Australia, I was conscious of some of the big fires that had happened over time and indeed this area had been threatened by big fires in 2003 and 2006 and so there was a consciousness in the area and we had a consciousness of fire. So Yakandanda is a, a town with a lot of bushland around it and so depending on where the fire is coming whether from the north right around the west to the uh, south we've got a lot of forest and uh, if the fire is coming at us from any of those particular directions we we're sort of very much on high alert. One dimension of our preparations for summer is that we do prepare a tub and that 
plastic tub has in a range of things that we uh, feel we would need if we ended up in the situation we were having to defend our house or our, our lives, I suppose. And that includes a range of um, overalls that we would use, um, face masks, helmets, uh, a bit of firefighting equipment by way of um, a backpack pressure pump for water uh, and a, a two rake hose. And of course we have uh, mops and large 44 gallon drums of water, which we don't keep water in and uh, we have them available should we head into that scenario where we would um, be thinking a fire is on its way. In our fire plans and on Black Saturday, we had some quite defined places that we were intending to go to and those places were away from the forested area that is Yakandanda and into open open country and in particular one place uh, some friends of ours have a, a property next to Lake Hume and so it, it's in open country and it is next to a large lake and so for us represents a much more secure place to be. A and we're conscious too that that could be a, a decision not about overnight or for a couple of hours but over an extended period of time. Every summer we set ourselves up for the possibility of fire coming to our property. Some of the things we do is we bring our horses in very close to the house and we get them to graze down the paddocks that are directly around the house. Every December I'm renowned for getting out my water containers and mops and filling them up and putting them on our verandas. Um, our gutters we clean, our sprinklers systems that we have on our house and on our stables are run through and our ability to pump up to our tanks and for them to be kept full on high fire danger days is tested. The garden is predominantly European deciduous trees and uh, it was very well wet down on Black Saturday started about three o'clock. We had some conifers up the driveway and we lost all of those. But again, further down on the driveway, we've got some deciduous trees and they survived. Um, I've lived here since I was seven and um, so just, just under 50 years. So it's been a long time. Well, really, we have never had the experience of fires here because it's traditionally been irrigation area. So I've never really fought a fire at all. We'd never even considered going and I guess that part of our plan, not that we had a big plan, but we had a fire pump and we had a swimming pool full of water. So but that was the extent of our fire plan. Look, we were pretty good. There wasn't a lot of long grass, there wasn't a lot of trees at the front of the house, but at the back for here there's a lot of scrub and that the heat from that was huge. So I think you need to look at your individual circumstances. Talk to the CFA, they're the guys that know. If you're not sure what a good fire plan is, go and talk to them because they're more than happy to, to help. I've lived here 34 years, thereabouts. Coming up from the city into a bush area, I was quite aware that bushfires could be a problem sort of did a bit each year. Uh, the main thing was the sprinklers on the roof. And um, when I built the house, I put fairly large areas of glass in there and it's all laminated glass. Uh, it's very thick glass. And in hindsight, it was one of the best things that I'd, I'd ever done with the house because talking to other people, experiences that they had um, yeah, the glass was just one of those things that just blew in straight away in their homes, you know. Every summer you'd clean up around the place, make sure that you've got no rubbish or the gardens are all tended to. And um, we do a fire drill every year uh, with the family. It took them a little while to get used to that. They thought it was a bit of a waste of time at first, till after the fires. The amount of water that I've got here is 120,000 litres under this concrete slab here. On that day, I estimate that we used about 70,000 litres of water. 
We had always planned to stay. We had made that decision probably two or three years before um, Black Saturday. We'd always thought we'd um, be able to defend, mainly because it had been cleared at the back and the grass was kept low. We thought, well, yeah, we would stay and defend if the need arose. And the need arose. <laughs> People that live along the King Parrot Creek had pumping rights. We do have a pump that sits down on the creek and it's always down there in summer. It has five outlets where we can attach sprinklers, we can attach handheld hoses, and we always knew um, that at the time, if anything did happen again, especially after 82, that we did have plenty of water. From probably 2006, we also had 44 gallon drums sitting on corners of the house. You need dray loads of water if you're going to defend a house. Also our house sits amongst all deciduous, your old English trees. It is green, it's watered regularly and um, on that day the deciduous trees filtered out embers, they filtered out radiant heat and um, the garden basically helped save my life, my husband's life and the house. I can't put it any other way. Our fire plan was just to, if there was a fire, go. We never ever considered, we never had um, sprinklers on the roof and having just water tanks and everything running off electricity, we just assumed the power would go out and then we'd have no way of fighting any fires. So our, our fire plan was just, if fire comes, let's just go. There was no talk about staying or defending the property. Our preparation, I guess, been done over a, a long period of time. The, when we built the house, it's a steel framed house. We always knew that there was, with the possibility of fire and wooden verandas, that that was a, a risk for us. So we had sprinklers, a sprinkler system on the house that was both on the roof, on top of the roof and under the verandas and, and able to keep the house you know, pretty much um, wetted during a fire. We've got a couple of large concrete tanks 12,000 gallons in one and 10,000 in another. And we're pretty fortunate in that we've got about a 200 metre buffer between us and any significant bush, so it's grass all around. For people who are thinking about staying, I'd, I'd highly recommend that you think about having a generator because it just means you, even when you're working in the house or in the house at that point of time, you've got light, you can see, you're not tripping over things in the dark and, and so on. I've been a resident of Caligny for more than 16 years now. Uh, my property is uh, 42 hectares and I run beef cattle only here. I'm also a member of the police force and due to the nature of my profession, I had a, a very extensive understanding of uh, bushfires. I'd been through a number of uh, very severe ones, including the Warburton complex and also the Glengarry fires which is about two years prior to the onset of Black Saturday. It's a misnomer that you can fight a fire. You don't fight a fire. You take action prior to the fire to protect as much of your property as you can. You then go inside your house and you wait for the fire event to pass over you. And then you go back outside and you do whatever you can in, in a mopping up process. So you need to keep in mind that uh, radiant heat will kill you and so will smoke inhalation. So you need to include in your fire plan, as did we, tactics to negate those primary concerns. Leading up to the uh, day of Black Saturday, we'd been watching the weather and of course it had been a prolonged dry period, so we were very conscious of what the landscape was doing. And uh, of course there was the very hot, dry couple of weeks leading into Black Saturday, which was really alerting us to the, con uh, the concern and the possibility of fire. And uh, we were very alert to the 
the dangers associated with fire on, on that particular day. On Black Saturday itself, we had made a decision that we weren't going to stay here if, the, if a fire occurred. But we were conscious we wanted to try and have the property in a condition that it had its best chance. And the building that we've got out the back there had uh, unrendered straw. And so we spent a couple of hours early in the morning before it got too hot attempting to get some mud onto that building to try and protect, you know, vaguely some chance of uh, ember attack. But uh, it started to get too hot for the render to work or for indeed for us to do it comfortably. And so we um, stopped, especially in the afternoon in this area and no doubt many others reminded us of Mad Max. There was a hot northerly wind. It was, it was hot, it was dry and very little vegetation on the ground that was there was very burnt and dry. On the day of Black Saturday, we were very clear we, we were going to leave at the first sign that a fire was in our direct vicinity. I was well aware of the extreme fire conditions on the day, yeah. I, um, I went to work in that, that morning and left the job about 10 o'clock and uh, told the site foreman that uh, I was going home to prepare in case there was a bushfire and he, he said to me that he'd heard some excuses in his life and he'd never heard that one. And uh, yeah, after the fires went through, it was probably a week and a half before he could get in contact with me because all the mobile tower and that was down. So um, yeah, he was very apologetic when he actually got on to me. <laughs> The first time we were aware of it was when we went out the back door and we could smell it. We, we could just smell that there was smoke in the area and just concerned about where, where was it and you know, was it in the area or maybe was it perhaps even a little desert on fire again or we just weren't sure but we could smell it. We realised the seriousness of the situation when um, my friend who works for the CFA was able to call and, and she said that there was a fire heading directly towards our property and to get the, our fire action plan in place. Basically then it was panic um, because we hadn't, we hadn't actually worked on a specific fire plan so it was just trying to draw on information from friends, you know, my sister had had a, a fire, I was trying to remember what she had done, different advice that she'd given from the experience that they had, trying to draw on what, what do we do, what, what, what's the next thing to do. My role was closing windows um, getting things off the verandas and getting some and changing clothes to get some clothes on to, to be ready for when the fire arrived. For Gary's role, he went straight out to the shed to get the fire pump. So we were pretty well ready to, to um, attack the fire when it arrived. And we were just then waiting for it to come across the paddock. From the time we noticed that the fire was coming, the smoke was just relentless. It's not, not like you can look across the paddock and see a fire coming. Um, if you're in, a, in the, the path of it, the smoke, it just comes and it gets thicker and thicker. Um, the ash, there's ash coming, there's embers coming. You can hardly breathe. We were trying to get, um, you know, something to cover our noses. Um, I tried to get men's hankies, but they weren't big enough. Then I tried tea towels and they were, they were too, too tight, uh, too big to try and tie. So we just, at the, you know, in the heat of the moment, you just couldn't find the right thing. We've, but in a fire plan, it would be, you know, have masks there and have sunglasses there and have hats. We didn't sort of grab a lot of those things. We didn't have enough hoses and I was basically allocated one hose which I had to run with from, you know, the front of the house to the back of the house and back to the front. And at one stage, right when the flames were here, the, um, the plastic fitting gave away. It snapped in my hand and on my heart just sank. I thought, oh no, now what have I got? I've got no hose. And um, my, my son-in-law was here, here helping and he saw me sort of looking at it and he came flying in and um, grabbed it and went out to the shed and grabbed another fitting and was able to fit it. But it really just proves on a day like that, you need to have hoses basically on every tap. We did a lot of work out ourselves. We had some friends call in that were going past. That was very valuable to have those extra set of hands running around, you know, trying to, one was using the, the fire pump, the other one had hoses. We were just trying to wet things down and try and push the fire around us.
about 1.30, we went outside, we could see the smoke through the trees. And at that time, we started to put in place our final preparations because we knew we were going to be impacted directly from that fire with the southwesterly wind change. And the things we did was spill, fill the spouting with water, uh, clear the veranda, and make sure that the veranda sprinklers were going and the garden adjacent to the house was wet. We'd prepared well beforehand. We had overalls on, we had a good leather hat, we had smoke mask, uh, smoke goggles, um, we had leather gloves. So we, were, we considered ourselves to be well prepared with the right protective clothing. So that sort of preparation is, is vital. So on the day my wife called me roughly 1.30 and, and she said she'd had a, a um, call from the neighbour that there was smoke in the area. She was a bit concerned so we came home pretty much straight away and, and started preparing on the day. Um, and those sorts of things included um, getting our gas bottles and, and moving them away from the house. Um, we had a bit of timber and stuff that was around the house, tidied all that up. We've got a hay shed that's about 20 metres from the house and it's not a good spot for it. I guess we recognise that now. On the afternoon I got the tractor out and, and piled dirt around the, the base of the, the shed to, to keep embers out from getting in underneath the shed. And we um, stuffed the cracks in the doors up with, with old chook bags and, and that very fortunately, and I don't know how, but it managed to keep the shed from catching a light. We've since moved that hay, sh or not moved the hay shed, but moved hay out of that shed and we, we don't use that shed for, for hay anymore because it's just too close to the house. If it had gone up, we would have had a real problem on the day. I don't think we realised how serious that fire was until it had actually been through. But at three o'clock we started to kick in our fire plans and um, so our sprinklers were going by three o'clock. Everything was being tested. We did put our horses into our dirt and concrete floored stables. When we put them in we took all their rugs and their head collars off and I did close the top doors of the stables so that if they got a fright they wouldn't be jumping out of the stables and causing more harm. Domestic animals were put in the stables um, with the horses as well, contained, um, and we made it to priorities. We made um, the house, if we could save the house, that was actually number two. Number one priority was saving the stables and the animals that were in it. And number two was if we could, we would save the house as well. And anything beyond that perimeter uh, just was not for us to worry about. So that's the protocol that we followed on the day. I was asleep with a, because my newborn was the first day I'd ever had a day nap at the same time as my son and my husband woke me up after having a few phone calls from friends and he was just listening to the radio because he was listening to the cricket the day before, he was on the same station and he was just outside and um, uh, my cousin rang to say that a friend of hers who lived in King Lake had heard that the fires were on their way and that uh, a fire truck from King Lake West had got in trouble. So, that was the first time, it was about 3.30 in the afternoon and he woke me up and said, we're going. Um, and I just said, let me just feed Billy before we go. And, and, and then he asked me what I wanted to pack. And I said, oh, don't worry, I'll just pack it after I finish feeding. He's like, no, what do you want to pack? So I just gave him a few instructions and he just threw a whole lot of stuff in the car. Um, and so by the time I'd finished with Billy, he just made me get in the car. That particular day, I was uh, due to work an afternoon shift and I was trying to snooze in a house that got to 45 degrees. I was uh, telephoned by a friend of mine around 3.30 who alluded me to the fact that there's a huge fire that had been started uh, on the eastern edge of the Churchill area and uh, could I see it? And I naturally looked north, couldn't see anything and he said, well, you better get outside and have a look because it's huge. I had an, an extensive fire plan set up and my son and I had revisited that uh, uh, the previous week and it did worry me when I saw this, um, this fire plume that just on the off chance it may end up affecting us. So I've grabbed the first five things on my uh, property list um, that I'd made as part of the fire plan and thrown them into my car before going into work. 
from the time it was actually over, it probably would have been maybe two or three hours because um, the main fire front had gone through, but everything just kept flaring up all the time. We had a lot of spot fires in right through all the gardens. Um, we had bark that just kept reigniting all the time. Um, trees, you know, there's a fear of trees catching fire, so we're trying to put the big trees out so they didn't fall and land on the house. So we were just continually running and with water, buckets of water, hoses, um, just trying to put out the spot fires as well. Because my cousin had rang and she said, just come to my place. And I just, when I sort of quickly had a look around the house before we left, I thought, oh, we'll be back tonight, we'll be fine, and left a whole lot of stuff that I wish I had have taken. Because um, it was about 20 minutes from when I woke up to when we got in the car. So I, we said we'd meet her down at her place in King Lake, uh, sorry, in Greensboro. And when we drove out, we went to the King Lake West CFA where there was one person there and we said, um, where we were going and he said no, the, the roads are closed to get down through Whittlesea. So we went towards King Lake and when we got to King Lake there was just, you wouldn't even be able to tell that there was a danger anywhere because we rang our neighbours to say that we were leaving and they had no idea, people were just going about their business. So we got into King Lake and thought maybe we were being a bit overreacting maybe a little bit to it all so we just thought we'd keep going anyway and just try and get off the mountain because we were packed and had our dogs with us and stuff so we thought about going down Hurstbridge but we thought no it's a bit too bushy so we went to go through Yarra Glen and then when we got almost to Yarra Glen uh, there was a roadblock there um, and they made us turn around because uh, the fires had just gone through Yarra Glen and as we were turning around at the roadblock on the left hand side as we were going back towards King Lake there was flames on the paddocks and they were going faster than our car was and we could see them really clearly. They weren't very far away. So that was the first sort of sign of the fire that we saw. Oh, and when we left, we saw the billowing smoke coming up the mountain. At about 4.30, we saw, um, it just looked like an atomic bomb had gone off um, southwest of us at King Lake West. We knew there was a change and from that time on we just got the hoses, the hoses were already ready. Fibro sheeting um, put around the house where the where, where embers could get underneath. We cut down ferns that adjoined the house, we cut down all the trees that were up against the house. With the water on the house we had three sprinklers on three sides of the house going because during a fire guard um, talk we had talked about that you need to keep at least um, six feet from your house totally wet for embers that were falling. And um, the pump was turned on about quarter to five and the house was starting to be drowned. About an hour, hour and a half before we got hit with the fire, it went really, really black. It was as black as night. Um, you just couldn't see. And if you're thinking about leaving at that time of the day, that's when it's too late. There's potential for the road to be blocked. You just can't see. Um, it's just too dark and too dangerous to be leaving late in the day. Went back up the mountain and then I suggested we go back to King Lake to see what was going on. And my husband just said, no, we won't. We'll just keep going to yay. So as we were driving to Yay, there wasn't very many cars on the road, so it wasn't like it was really busy and lots of people were evacuating. Um, so we're driving towards Yay and there was a, a tree had fallen over and there was already a tractor there pulling the tree off the road. There was about four cars in front of us. And then on the way to Yay, we stopped at a petrol station to get just some water. There was just confusion everywhere. There was no power in the petrol station already because as we were leaving the power went off at our house too so we had no phone no water no nothing so that was a good time to leave anyway um, so yeah we left the petrol station and we got up to yay and yay was pretty busy and we just sat in yay and sat in the air conditioning we could get out of the car a little bit because it was hot but there was no smoke there and then we waited in line with everyone else in town to sort of fill up with petrol to make sure that we had enough, like kept the fuel tank full just in case we had to travel somewhere else. That would have been at about five o'clock, I think, about five o'clock. We probably put our gear on at about five. 
Um, so put our overalls and uh, breathing apparatus not on, but um, handy and easy to get. Um, we'd put some water bottles out, you know, we were ready. It wasn't really an ember attack until the front was nearly on us, only probably two or three kilometres away, you know, not even that probably by the time the wind turned. Outside the sprinklers were going, I did have a couple of the fire hoses pointed at, in different directions at each end of the house and we had of course um, sinks and baths and that with water in it and uh, if we noticed any embers coming in you know we, we didn't mind throwing a bucket of water over, over a curtain or blind. When the main part of the fire was here the whole house was just literally shaking and um, there's three sets of double doors down the bottom and two of them blew open and um, flames actually come in from the garden and I'd say it was, a fair, it was a mature garden with mature trees in it but it would have had to be a good 16 metres away and at the same time the doors blew open the wallaby ran in the house and uh, we had pets we had about seven pets in the house five dogs and a couple of cats that people had bought and I've got to tell you the wallaby was the best behaved one of a lot of them had just come in put its head in the corner in the games room and stayed there for about three hours before it left and didn't move the whole time but um, it was pretty frightening when the doors did blow open because you had to have the people there in the house at different points to be aware of these things because if we my wife and I were up um, upstairs here on this level and if we were the only two here we probably wouldn't have gone downstairs because it, it's all solid brick and we wouldn't have been particularly worried about it so yeah you've got to really be able to cover all points. We had seven adults and six children in the house. The dogs were here and uh, they weren't restrained and you got people running around and on top of that, when the doors blew open, you get a bit of smoke in the house, the smoke alarms are going off. So yeah, all in all, it was a fairly hectic scene inside the house, even though we were, we were safe. And, and I was always under the impression that they would all be just sitting downstairs watching TV because the power was on. We had TV on, the kids were last I seen them. We're all sitting down watching TV and um, and that's the way they would have gone through the whole scenario but that wasn't the case. They were quite aware of what was happening outside and uh, from what I was told a couple of them were fairly panic stricken about the whole thing you know. To me it was like a, watching a chemical reaction going on behind the glass that the, the, the thick smoke was right up to the glass and all you could see was this red glow in, in amongst the thick smoke, you know, like there was no way you were going to survive outside and you know after the fire went through there was kangaroo in the garden down the bottom that was fine. It hadn't been burnt because it had got in close to the house and it was getting wet from the spray from the sprinklers. But it died anyway and that, that just would have been because there was no oxygen in the air, that there was such thick you know, smoke around the place that nothing would have survived out there anyway. You know. I, I would say that um, we actually got out about 20 minutes after the fire, main fire front hit and that probably would have been about half past five, 25 to six or something. Yeah, and get the hoses and then start, you know, make sure that everything was all right around the place. And uh, yeah, like I say, there was three, at least three of us out, maybe four outside. And um, yeah, well, little, wasn't too much longer we were outside and we knew that we'd we had it beat, which was a great experience. About half past five, uh, the sky started to uh, darken with smoke, uh, become pitch black about um, 
about a quarter to six, uh, the power went out. It flickered for a few times and, uh, and the power was cut at that stage. From about six o'clock, we could start to see the glow of the fire coming. We were impacted by the first stage of embers, floating embers that were starting spot fires on the lee side of the house. We're on the lee side of the house here, and uh, this is the area where we considered most of our spot fires at start. With our past experience living here at Caligny, uh, dry leaves and so on would all drop in this area and not blow under the house, and so therefore we, we thought that embers would land here. So we based ourselves, myself and my mate Steve, based ourselves here with fire hoses. I was up this end of the house and Steve was down the other end. And we put out spot fires as they started and uh, protected the house from this side. At the time, the radiant heat from the fire and the embers were absolutely horrific. But as the fire front went by, after about 15 minutes, we were able to then focus more on the little spot fires that were starting up on the decking and around the, the garden and the, the grass areas and around the, the swimming pool and so on. But during the fire front itself, there was not a lot we could do because it was just such mayhem. I have to say we're pretty calm when the firestorm hit us a lot calmer than what I thought we were going to be. It was just do what you had to do. We'd spoken about it enough. We were prepared, we were ready. We felt like we'd been waiting for a few hours actually. Um, but uh, yeah, we quite calm. And, and we just got about what, what we'd planned to do. It went very black. <laughs> you can't see. You couldn't see a couple of metres in front of you. There were times when someone was beside me using the um, hose and I didn't realise they were there until you actually heard the whoosh of the water. We were lucky during the fire we didn't go inside the house. We did shelter on the opposite side of the house to uh, a lot of where the heat was coming from. Um, and I think that's partly because we had um, the protective overalls on, gloves, um, breathing apparatus, uh, we had plenty of water. Um, so, but it was, it was hot and it was very smoky. The, the filters on our breathing apparatus when we looked at them later were absolutely black. Um, I think if we hadn't had that, we would have had to go inside to give ourselves some sort of relief. The front probably lasted about 20 minutes after the front came through it was really the time to get really active um, because the front sort of barrels its way through noise, dark, heat, smoke, um, can't see um, but as that disappears daylight came again and uh, that's when you've got to get out and start putting some of those things that might have caught on fire but haven't yet fully ignited and, and help save them. I was given the opportunity to return to my property in order to fight the fires and also because I knew my son was back here and my intent was to save the house and then resume duty and that certainly didn't happen. I arrived here at 6pm, completed opening the gates by uh, quarter past uh, six because cattle are quite intelligent in the event of a fire they know what to do. By opening up all the gates around the farm, it allowed them to go where they wanted to. They jumped in my big dam. We were prepared for bushfires. Uh, in Australian summers, bushfires tend to come from the north or the northwest, and it couldn't have been further from the truth. I was impacted from the southwest in a cool change. I was expecting that cool change to make a difference and to soften the, the fire front and all it did was we had uh, six to eight hours of extremely hot air come through from the southwest, uh, driving a 10 kilometre fire front, which had been set up by the original northerly burn. So you can't rely on a southwesterly change to save you. The fire hit our place roughly 6.30, 6.45 at night that day. It had been dark for about an hour beforehand with the smoke coming over. It was nearly pitch black. You could hardly see anything at all. Then it started to get pretty smoky and we had embers, an ember attack at that point in time. And 
and my son and I were outside trying to put embers out. Um, it got to a point where it was just too smoky and, and we couldn't stay outside any longer and, and headed inside and I, I seem to remember a couple of minutes later the, the fire actually hit and came through. It was smoky inside the house as well. The smoke alarms were, were sounding which sort of added, you know, adds to all the, the sense of, of urgency and, and panic. From in the house we could see the plantation go up just a, a fireball of flame in the, in the plantation and, and then a haystack in the distance was on fire. We could see out one window and there were f burning embers flying past the window horizontally, I guess, you know, blown with the wind that was pretty strong at that point in time. And that went on for about 15 minutes or so. We were reasonably well set up inside. We had buckets of water and towels in a, a few of the windows. And I did go outside a couple of occasions during the time that that it was coming through and um, certainly really smoky and hard to see and, and breathe outside. Going outside was to put out bushes that were burning right up, right up close to the front of the house. Treated pine fence posts were burning all over the place. Had a little fire in one of our sheds. It was fortunate that I went in there and managed to, to be able to put that out before it, it sort of got hold. Our sprinkler system that we had, which included sprinklers in under the eaves helped us a significant amount because that really stopped stuff that was close to the house from, from continuing to burn. When the fire impacted on my property it was coming across the back hay paddock and it was swirling like a washing machine motion in two three hundred metre wide circles and there was two of them. Uh, the, uh, the, the flames, I, I thought, were extending about 60 metres in, into the air. I was later told they were probably close to 600 metres in, into the air. By the time we come back up here, the ember attack was full on, and rather than having a spot fire here and a little one, you know, 30 feet uh, over there, which we were prepared to go and put out, it was just lighting up like Lucifer around us, everywhere. So we gave that idea up of, of trying to put out the spot fires. We then uh, went inside the house. I was expecting the windows to go black and, and fracture slightly and uh, perhaps to start shattering. Um, when the, the firestorm hit us, that certainly happened. The, you, we watched the windows go brown and then black within the space of about 30 seconds. And then literally uh, the house in um, imploded, the, the windows exploded in on us. Immediately came to the realisation the house is lost. So then we've uh, gone and got all the wet towels and, uh, and the provisions that, we, that my son had set aside, the water bottles, the, the lanterns. And we waited as long as we could inside the house because the firestorm was going over the top of us. So that was the vapour fire as it rolled through. We left the house on the uh, eastern side uh, through a, a, a glass sliding door and we sheltered in an alcove area um, which was, uh, there's a concrete plinth up there and sat there um, because at that stage the fire was around us 360 degrees in the air and 360 degrees on the ground. So we sheltered on that uh, concrete area for about uh, five minutes and then the house had really lit up uh, from the inside and I said Tim uh, time to go to the, the uh, concrete tank. So this is where we took shelter leaning up against the wall protecting our faces breathing through the towels I had my water bottle and the lantern down here this is where the lantern started to melt so my son and I moved across burning ember beds around the other side of the tank and ended up here. Here you can see the remains of the variegated uh, potostrum and it was quite large and then we, uh, we simply knelt behind it. So we crouched there with towels over our face behind this big stump. And uh, that's what protected us from the uh, radiant heat. And when the fires were going through and I was sitting there, I couldn't even see the, the watch face in front of my face. I couldn't tell the time. It was that accurate. And uh, yeah, so that tree really saved our lives and the tank.
We knew there was going to be a southwest change. We knew that the fire was at King Lake West, so we knew the valley was in trouble about three hours before it hit us. Um, unfortunately for us, though it hit with no smoke warning, with no fire, visible fire warning, um, the noise was horrendous before it hit and then, it, and then it basically just absolutely rained embers, rained embers down on us before you could actually still either smell smoke or visibly see fire. From those embers, my neighbours' houses all went up in flames and still no smoke. And so the sprinklers were, were going so that the house was being totally watered, but also the surrounds, all the gardens surrounding it was also being watered as well. My husband had a handheld hose and I did as well. So we were watering um, the garden as well as the house to keep it totally wet. After um, a spate of time, the, the pump did fail. The pump failed because of, it was burnt, burnt out. Um, we went inside because that was when the fire front was, was, was hitting us. Um, we went inside. Husband wouldn't stay inside for very long because, well, they say 10 minutes. He lasted about three or four and said, I don't know what's going out on outside and I need to get outside to see. He was outside putting out spot fires. Every five minutes I was climbing the ladder in the bathroom up into the roof and checking that there were no um, smouldering embers. Um, within our roof cavity. With me I had of course needed a torch and I also had a water pistol. One of those great big water pistols that you can squirt and, and they go a fair distance um, because um, yeah, if you needed to put out a fire within your roof cavity they were the best um, at the time. Robert went outside after the, the front had gone over and he's, he was putting out spot fires all over the place. At that time, the drums that were filled with water proved absolutely invaluable to fill up buckets and to be able to go and um, put the water on a spot fire where it was occurring. And of course, when that fire's gone over, that's when it can be the most difficult, putting out spot fires, because if, if you're not there to put them out, that's when they cause so much damage and destruction from about half past seven, 25 to eight, when it actually hit us with embers. And that's when I watched all my neighbours' houses burn. That was before the main fire front. By quarter past eight, or not even that long, the whole valley was basically up in flames. So when the smoke began to clear, and it was still coming through in waves, but we could see reasonably well and there wasn't the ferocity of the flame so we went for an inspection around the home block. Could see that there was uh, nothing left. The house was uh, gone, my machinery shed was gone, um, the hay shed was gone, all the infrastructure around here was gone. There was nothing left standing other than the concrete tank. My son had had his four wheel drive sitting on the driveway out, um, without anything surrounding it. It had uh, caught fire and the intensity of the, of the flames and the fireballs that went through was enough to uh, melt the windshield glass so that it looked like liquid river over his uh, dashboard and running down the sides of his doors. So we knew they were pretty hot fires. The, the fire plan that we made worked. Uh, my son and I are a living testimony to that. We survived the worst fire event uh, in recent history that Australia's ever ever seen being a firestorm. In all honesty, my house couldn't be saved in that fire event. It wasn't designed to last that fire event because it impacted under my house and there's no way that I could have saved it. The way that I will modify my fire plan is to obviously incorporate the new house. I'm building a house that will be fireproof. It'll be made out of masonry, in my case, Hebel block. All my garden will be English garden. I'll have uh, a shelter for the uh, car so that I've got access and transport uh, after the fire. I'll put a fire suppression system on the roof. I'll certainly have um, more petrol pump firefighters and put them on independent uh, systems that are reticulated. So if I need to, I can pump for weeks if I had the fuel in order to suppress the fires. So any infrastructure that you need to save needs to be under a fire suppression system. There's lots of information that you can get not only on the internet but from your local CFA that will assist you in 
developing first of all a quality fire plan but also set up infrastructure on your property so that uh, you can save your primary residence but also being farmers to take action so that you can uh, uh, save you the animals that you run and, and perhaps even the crops that you grow. Prior to Black Saturday we had a Fatinia hedge that was about two metres tall that ran from right up the property on the southwest side which is where the fire came from and on that night the Fatinia hedge acted as a barrier and, and gave us a fighting chance. We would stay and defend again. There is one thing definitely we would do different. Our plan was if the house did go up and we couldn't save it we would head for the creek and we would not have survived. It would have been too hot, too open to try and get to it. it, it the creek also is surrounded by bush. So what we would do the next time, if the house did go, um, with a second pump, you'd stay by your tank and um, put your second pump in and, and basically stand there and, and drown yourself in water and hope that you survive it. We still struggle with the fact that we were isolated for those few days after the fires and uh, the power was uh, cut of course and uh, it was out for two or three weeks. Phones were cut, they weren't reconnected for two or three weeks. So it was very isolating, we had to organise generators and uh, an alternative communication methods. It meant that because of the roadblocks uh, for a few days after the fires, We'd meet our friends at the roadblocks to get food supplies and so on. So it was very isolating and it was blocked for a reason because the police had declared it a crime scene because of the people that were killed. Some of the things that we'd improve in terms of our planning would be, uh, and, and some of those things we've already done, is to move some of our native vegetation back away from the house native vegetation is a lot more inflammable than uh, deciduous trees and things like fruit trees which were great barriers uh, with the fire. We would uh, install fixed sprinklers around the veranda. At the time we had uh, movable sprinklers that we had to shift at about every 10 minutes and they did a wonderful job but fixed sprinklers might save us a little bit of time. Our decision whether to stay and defend or go for future fires depends very much on how our health is at the time, how well prepared we are both mentally and physically. If we felt as prepared as we did for Black Saturday, we'd probably stay. Um, but if, if, um, if our health was not so good as what it was then, we'd probably leave early. We did originally say that we were going to rebuild and then I was a little bit apprehensive because I knew that there's not going to be a fire go through the year after but I thought later down the track when the kids are older and they're at school on the mountain and I'm at work and they wouldn't if if a fire came through and they wouldn't let me back up and those sort of things I don't think I'd ever feel comfortable during a summer so we decided to um, sell put the block on the market and look for a house back where we originally lived so if, if I lived there now I'd have all my keepsakes ready to go I'd go to any meetings that like the community ra uh, was running about fire awareness where there was going to be places for safety to evacuation points. Uh, I just have knowledge. I was, we were completely and utterly ignorant when it came to what to do because it wasn't a point that anyone really pushed on us when we moved to the area. It wasn't said that, oh, you know that this could possibly happen and you should be ready. I was pretty amazed that there wasn't a thing left. There wasn't a leaf left or a twig or anything. And um, yeah, and it was a very strange experience because as I was draining the water out of the tank, I heard this scratching going on behind me and there was three lyrebirds in the water trail scratching away. And I thought they must either go into creeks, there's a couple of creeks down there, or they've got to go into wombat holes. My ideas changed a lot. If it was my choice, I wouldn't stay again. If, another, if we had another day like that, uh, if I had the opportunity to get out, I would go before the fire even got here. 
um, mainly because I don't think whatever preparations you put into place, you only need something small to go wrong um, and it could, you know, it, it could mean difference between life and death. So my first option next time would be to go. It's great having the house set up. You've got to have everything in place, everything prepared, everything ready just the same. But first option would be to go. Like everybody, we're faced with a, a decision about leaving early or staying. And we had made a decision to leave. And the question is, what's the definition uh, on that day for early? And uh, I think there's a complexity there that is quite challenging to answer and that the answer is related to how dry it is on the day, what the wind patterns are for the day, what the projections of humidity are. And so we don't have an absolute point at, at which we're saying if it's eight o'clock in the morning we will leave. We, we have a default position that we will leave and we will update that default position depending on the prevailing conditions on that day or indeed on that, that week or whatever. And it's also uh, quite a, a challenging environment in a community sense because obviously as soon as we leave, we cease to be a contributor to a community fire response. So we didn't get a fire front coming through here and in fact ended up not coming all of that close, but we now each year do some planning to put our, ourselves in a position where the, either the property is most likely to survive or if we happen to be in the property, we can defend ourselves and the property. We've got toughened glass on all the windows. We've prepared cement sheeting boards to paste over all the doors and windows. We've put cement sheeting right around the subfloor area and, and we're in the process of installing a, a fire pump and putting in sprinklers on the eaves and on the roof. We haven't done that yet, but it's part of the ongoing plan. I don't think I would change any of our actions that we did on the day. I hope I never have to find that one out. <laughs> but I felt that we were very well prepared. There have been some things that we have changed. Our independent water supply is now gravity fed rather than relying on a, a pump that is sitting in amongst trees. We have added another petrol pump and we replaced a plastic water tank with a, a concrete one. We haven't changed our mind about staying or leaving. We have discussed it um, since and uh, as a family, no, our decision would still be to stay, but that is as long as we are 100% prepared and ready and we all feel capable of, of doing it again. So with our setup, I would say, yes, we will be staying. With each individual setup, I would have to say, you need to think it through very thoroughly. In the few days after the fires, because the, the police had the declared it um, a crime scene we were we were pretty much locked in we couldn't well we could have gone out but if we'd gone out we wouldn't have been allowed back in again and there, there's a group of about four or five of us in a couple of houses up the road that I guess started to work together pretty well in terms of looking after one another and so on we were lucky in that we had a generator and we were able to to keep power going and, and you know, keep the fridges and, and so on running our verandas, one of them did catch fire on the day, so we've decided now to replace this with concrete and, and cement sheet as a measure to make sure that it, it can't burn. We've also added shutters to all of our windows and sealed up the house a lot better under the eaves where the eaves meet the bricks and also under the ridge line of the house because we did find afterwards a lot of ash inside the roof in the house that had got in under the, the capping of the roof and also changed the vents on the roof of the house. We had one of those whirly bird vents before which is not fireproof and we've changed those over to some fireproof vents. I think we would still stay. We'd be prepared to make the decision if we had to on the day. We've certainly improved the 
the things in terms of keeping the house you know, safe, up, up, up the sprinkler system and got rid of the wooden verandas and, and so on. Um, I think in, in hindsight, we probably shouldn't have had the kids here on the day. You know, in, in future, I'd, I don't think we'd want to put the kids through that sort of trauma, I guess. Yeah, wouldn't put the kids through that again. One of the things that we've done as part of our five plan is to um, add a, a wall into the back of the house here so to stop the embers and everything were coming right through here. So it's been an important thing to try and block that off and make it a bit more fireproof for us. Obviously we've still got our swimming pool so we've got a permanent water supply. We've got our pump that we now, you know, it's all been used so we know how to, where to set it up. And um, my husband Gary is a plumber so he's been able to put in some really good fire reels. So we've, we know what we need now, if there's a fire coming, we know what to grab. Black Saturday for us at Haven, Remlaw and um, Drunk South, we were the ones that copped it on the day. Next time it could be you, you know, it could be your neighbour, it could be anybody. Um, you don't have to live in the mountains for something like this to happen. It can happen to anybody. It's just a spark in the wrong spot and if you're in the line of it, you need to be prepared for it.